We think our patch symbolizes the teamwork, not only here at the Johnson Space Center, but across the NASA contractor team and uh, bridging the oceans all the way over to Russia. And I think the successful accomplishment of Shannon's long duration mission and our successful docking and uh, joint operations aboard the Mir is a uh, testimony to that fact. We had a pretty spectacular night launch at the end of our day. Uh, let me tell you, there wasn't anybody that, uh, that was dozing off on the flight deck, though, because as soon as we cleared the tower, the master alarm started going off. <laughs> and it seemed like they were going off all the way to main engine cutoff about uh, eight and a half minutes later. Uh, right after main engine cutoff, I said, uh, tell the mirror that uh, Atlantis is underway. And then we heard that uh, the Shannon even saw us uh, all the way to main engine cutoff from, uh, from the mirror, which was pretty spectacular. Right after we got in orbit, you could see it was a night launch, but uh, where we were in the world, it was already daytime, and we saw the, the sun rise on orbit and uh, immediately put Terry to work, not only on the HEU subsystem, but, uh, but also on the overhead panel. And, uh, and this is what starts turning uh, what is a rocket ship there for eight and a half minutes into a spacecraft for 10 days. Uh, it's, it's just an amazingly versatile ship that we have, the orbiter. And uh, as you can see here, Terry's in the overhead panel and we're reconfiguring, getting ready to do uh, our own Suburn. One of the things you might have noticed in that slide was that uh, I wasn't sweating. One of my fellow crew members pointed out that, that was the first time he had seen anyone get to orbit and not be drenched, and that's in large measure to the liquid cooling garment that we wear under our spacesuit now. And I tell you, we'd all like to, to thank the people that came up with that for us. Uh, once we got on orbit, we had uh, a few days to do science before we docked with the mirror. This is one of our experiments. Uh, Carl Walsh is holding something called MGM, or it's called uh, the mechanics of granular materials. And uh, it studies the behavior of materials like sand, which is what's in that, uh, that container. Uh, or any other granular material, and we hope that uh, with this experiment, the engineers will be able to use the information to strengthen building codes in earthquake areas, uh, uh, get more information about what triggers avalanches, study beach erosion, even the behavior of materials in silos. It was a good experiment, and they got good information out of it. Next slide, please. Bill, can you back up one? I just wanted to say one more thing, please. Uh, you might notice uh, Carl's hat there. Uh, he was wishing that he had a St. Louis Cardinal hat on. And <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, please. The, uh, we called this slide the attack of the water bag. Uh, one of the things we transferred to Muir was, was water. Uh, unlike us, where we make water with our fuel cells when we produce electricity, uh, they don't make water, and it has to be carried up to them. And they use it, they break it apart to get their breathing oxygen, and of course they use it in their galley to uh, drink and rehydrate food with. Uh, each of those bags weighs about 100 pounds. We transferred 20 of them. I think it was a new record, uh, over 2,000 pounds of water. And uh, we figured, well, we filled eight of them before we docked. Uh, when the hatch opened, the first thing I want to do was, because you can see they're like sea cows uh, floating around, was, Larry, where do you want all this water? And he said, just keep it on the shuttle till you get ready to leave. But uh, <laughs> we managed to find a spot for it and uh, get it over to the, to the mirror. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, basically how we start our day. We didn't really launch with a flight plan. Uh, we, it was tips up to us uh, first thing every morning. And uh, you can see the tips machine there and, and the roll of paper uh, that comes out. It was pretty extensive, and uh, it took us a while to cut and paste into our flight plan every day. Jay also has on a headphone there. That's connected to our VHF radio. We use that for ship-to-ship -ship, uh, conversation with the mirror and also uh, for an experiment called SARX, which turned out to be a really good deal and I'm sure will be important to long-duration crew members because uh, each of the crew members on 79 got to make a personal phone call to their families. And I can tell you that's a real boost uh, for morale after you've been up there for a while. And we also used it to find out uh, sports scores, things like that, with random contacts. <laughs> and just to the right of Jay is uh, one of our freezers, uh, the blue box there, and that was used to return uh, biological samples uh, from Shannon's stay on Mir back to Earth. Next slide. On uh, flight day four, we got ready to do our rendezvous. Bill. Uh, got back in his commander's chair and picked out the, the rendezvous checklist and did a series of burns, of course, to start uh, our preparation for the rendezvous. Bill? Well, you just can't imagine what a breathtaking sight it is to see something in the uh, 
crew optical uh, sight. That is the mirror at approximately 600 feet away. And of course, we could see it much further out as the brightest star in the sky, but uh, as soon as we had done all our mid-course correction burns, you could start to see a little glimmer, and then, and then you'd see detail in the solar rays and then the modules. But, but I think this, this picture here at 600 feet shows you just what a remarkable complex it is that they've assembled over the last 10 years. Of course, the difference uh, between our flight and the previous one was uh, the orbiter was a little different with a double space hab module. And the other thing was the mirror was a little bit different because during Shannon's stay on board, the Perota, which means nature science module, had arrived. So we had a different orbiter configuration and a different mirror configuration. Uh, this is a shot that Shannon took of our arrival and we're uh, inside 170 feet at this point. Uh, you can see towards the aft part of the payload bay, the double space hab module. And then towards the forward part, you can see the orbiter docking system with the androgynous docking adapter there at the top, the black part. Uh, you can also see our KU band radar slung over there uh, on top of the radiator on the right-hand side of the orbiter. We're, uh, we've got our noses pressed to those overhead windows, those two little windows there, looking at Shannon as she's looking at us, as you might imagine. And you can also see the uh, reaction control jets kind of around the periphery of the orbiter there. This is a, a picture sh shortly after we were docked, and, and we show you this be because another change to the mirror configuration from the previous flight was in the upper corner of the picture, you can see the cooperative solar array, which was deployed during Shannon's mission by uh, Yuri Onofrienko and Yuri Usachov. Uh, that array extends down below the nose of the orbiter during the approach. The other thing that you see extending over the forward part of the payload bay is one of the base block arrays on the mirror station that extended down within a couple feet of the overhead window. You can see it in its unfeathered position right now after we've uh, arrived and the solar arrays are trying to, trying to track the sun uh, and, and gather solar energy. But uh, during the actual docking, that particular array was cutting across the, uh, the left-hand overhead window. Well, after we got the hatches open, we got down to what I considered was uh, the primary purpose of SDS-79, and that was the crew exchange. And to accomplish this crew exchange, we had to get John's suit from the shuttle over to Mir and his suit liner and all the periphery uh, equipment that he needed for the Soyuz in case they have to use the Soyuz as an emergency uh, escape vehicle. And then we had to get John in his suit, and then he had to get in the Soyuz and uh, do a pressure check. And after the pressure check on the scaphandra came out okay, then the Russians would accept John as a crew person uh, for Mir. Next slide. And after we got John's suit uh, checked out and it was uh, deemed okay, then it was time to take my scaphandra out of the Soyuz where it had been, uh, you know, for the entire flight and bring it over to the uh, shuttle and get ready to come home. And there, Sasha is helping me get that out. He's the board engineer that's now up on Mir. Next slide. And this is a shot of Valeri, the commander that's now up there on uh, Mir in the base block. Uh, this was the third commander that I had worked with since, um, oh, March. So that's not bad. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then right after this shot, then I was officially a member of the uh, shuttle crew, so then I was with my fourth commander. And uh, that's not a bad way to work, you know, have four different commanders in six months. It was pretty good. So in addition to uh, John and Shannon's uh, personal gear and the transfer uh, of that over very early in the mission, we also had, uh, for the first time, a double space hab. And the uh, aft uh, part of that space hab is where we had most of the other logistics and supplies that we were going to transfer <coughs> over to Mir and then uh, use to return the items uh, from Mir that Shannon and, and the Russians were sending home. This uh, kind of became uh, transfer headquarters here in this corner. That's where we kept our uh, paperwork and our procedures. You can see there something that's also unique is uh, the brown cloth lockers in front of me. Uh, those were for weight saving uh, in space hab, and you can, of course, see the regular hard lockers uh, over my right shoulder. So we had a variety of uh, different things. We could stow items in, large and small. 
behind my back there is where we had uh, three batteries we were taking up to Mir. And also right behind my head, you can see a couple of the uh, powered science experiments that we later were going to transfer to Mir. I also noticed the colored uh, labels on those cloth lockers. Uh, the, the blue ones meant they already had the return items in them. Uh, pink ones meant items still to go to Mir. And white cards uh, meant items not to be transferred. As I mentioned, we transferred uh, some Russian things over. This is a piece of Russian hardware, weighed about 250 pounds. It's a gyrodyne. This is Bill transferring it uh, from Space Hab through the tunnel almost into the ODS module, and he'd make a straight up turn out of the picture here to go up in uh, to the mirror. These uh, gyrodynes, they have several on mirror, and they're used uh, for attitude control. This is our uh, most valuable transfer item. And that uh, Shannon is, this is much a couple of days later in the mission, Shannon is uh, where the gyrodyne came from. And uh, she assured us uh, she didn't weigh quite as much and we did move her for entry. <laughs> <laughs> Transferred uh, some uh, scientific uh, samples over just to leave in microgravity for uh, a long period of time. This is actually a crystal uh, growth large uh, doer. It's actually like a big thermos bottle that uh, uses liquid nitrogen for cooling and we placed it over uh, in Cavant 1 behind a panel and it'll stay there until uh, STS-81 goes and retrieves it as we retrieve two that the STS-76 crew had left over in Cavant. Well, you know, I spent a, a year in Building 1 doing management training and this is what I really spent most of my time doing. <laughs> is up on the flight deck, a typical uh, flight deck picture. You can see the camera equipment uh, back behind me there. Uh, one of our uh, seats there behind me that we use on ascent and entry. And uh, pretty much where we spent a lot of time uh, taking pictures out the window. And you could always see mirrors. as you looked out the window overhead there. This was obviously a staged picture, because I don't think we ever saw a time like this the entire mission, other than when they were taking this. I tell you, he had total control of the, the transfer ops from start to finish. I don't think I ever saw him relax. Well, here's John uh, working in the uh, in his new home uh, on Mir. This is the pre rota module, and uh, the on the left and on the right are racked uh, U.S. standard uh, rack equipment uh, racks like the ones we have in the space shuttle. And uh, they're filled with uh, the scientific equipment that we transferred uh, from the mid-deck and the space hab over, over to Mir. And in the foreground, uh, you can see uh, an ex a French experiment called ALICE. And so here's John in his uh, laboratory um, working very hard. And he just started right away. And as we were undocking, uh, you could hear John on the other air to ground uh, trying uh, working very hard to uh, fix uh, one of the other payloads that we transferred that had a problem, uh, the bioreactor, and uh, he got it fixed, squared away. I'm, uh, I'm here in the, uh, in the aft portion of the double space hab uh, with uh, a new friend, the uh, Orlan spacesuit. Uh, the Orlan spacesuit is the EVA suit that the Russians use, and uh, up until this time, the Russians had never been able to bring one of these suits back to Earth uh, to analyze and, and to see how they did after several uses in space. And so uh, we're the first ones to be able to bring an Orlan suit back. And uh, this suit will first go to Russia and be refurbished uh, and, uh, and examined by the engineers at the Zvezda company there in Russia. And then we'll be upgraded and return to Johnson Space Center for testing with the space station uh, uh, airlock uh, test assembly. And uh, we'll prove it out uh, for use in the International Space Station. <coughs> now, we tried to use every possible nook and cranny uh, for transfer. And uh, in fact, on our Eris rack, which is a, a, a microgra microgravity uh, uh, test rack that we flew for space station, um, we filled that with uh, Russian food containers. And uh, near the end of our mission, we removed those food containers 
uh, from, from that rack and transferred them to Mir. And then we took empty food containers, uh, which you see in this picture, and, and uh, uh, Shannon and uh, Sasha there are taping them together to be inserted back into the Eris so we had enough room to bring them home. And we have a picture here in the central node, and that's uh, the Mir commander, Valeri Korzun, in the node. And, and, and that is uh, where all the modules uh, come together in Mir. And we would come up through the Crystal module into this node, and then you just sort of look around and, and try to figure out which module you wanted to go in. And, and you'd have to look up and down and uh, left and right. And uh, it was. Uh, probably the most disoriented that I've ever been in space. Uh, you'd look into the base block and you would see people in a normal attitude and then you'd uh, pan your body 90 degrees and you would see somebody standing on what appeared to be the ceiling. Although what really was was the module was uh, clocked uh, 180 degrees. And so those kind of visual things happened all the time on Mir. And it, was, it was very exciting, very interesting. Uh, one of the uh, things that consumed a lot of our time uh, during our dock phase was uh, filming IMAX. Uh, Tom Akers and I and uh, um, our commander, Bill Reedy, uh, spent a lot of time uh, setting up IMAX scenes uh, both in Mir and on the shuttle. And uh, we've had a chance to look at those, and they look really good. And, and uh, we're looking for the incorporation of this, uh, these scenes into the new IMAX uh, film about uh, our phase one program to Mir, and uh, that's uh, supposed to be released uh, in March of 97 to a theater near you. So <laughs> stay tuned. And here's this is a, a picture of Shannon, and uh, this is in the uh, tunnel ad adapter of the, uh, of the space shuttle. She made sure she was on the right side of the hatch when we got ready to undock. Fortunately, with all the science and uh, transfer activities going on, we each still managed to find time to look out the window and take pictures of our planet. Uh, we'll show you some of those pictures at the end of the slide. Uh, something else we were taking pictures of was the mirror. Next slide, please. Uh, we had a detailed test uh, numbered 1118, and it was the photo survey of the mirror. So we tried to take pictures of uh, literally every square inch of the mirror that was visible to us, the solar panels, the, the modules, uh, everything that we could. And the engineers here at JSC will study those pictures and uh, will determine how well the materials that Mir is made out of have withstood 10 years or, or less in space. And they can uh, use those to see where, what materials have degraded, what materials have oxidized. And you can use the location of some of the, uh, the off-gas materials, for instance, that have stained another part of the Mir to determine exactly uh, where it's coming from, what it is. And we hope to, our space station people will uh, avoid uh, those types of materials on the space station. That storm, by the way, is in the uh, southern, Indio in southern Indian Ocean, and it's one of several that we saw while we were in space. Next slide. Well, we got ready to say goodbye, and uh, one of the things we want to do is take a picture, the first crew picture of the new Mir crew. And uh, you can see the three of them there, and John in his, uh, his cosmonaut suit. Next slide. Shannon says she has mixed feelings. Uh, about leaving, and I'm certain that she did. Uh, the cosmonauts uh, treated us and her very, very well. Uh, it was a real team up there, and, uh, and anyway, it was time for her to say goodbye and uh, come aboard shuttle for the trip home. Next slide. Uh, after we closed the hatches, uh, we spent the night uh, attached to the mirror still, and then the next morning we got up and undocked, and I was fortunate enough to, uh, to get to do the fly around of the mirror, and this is a shot from that. You can see the docking module clearly at the top of the screen. This is a picture of the mirror at the Terminator. And uh, uh, you can see the blackness uh, on the dark side of the Earth at the top. And of course, uh, we're leaving the light at the bottom. Uh, people have asked me if the mirror was easy to see on the dark side. And it was very easy to see. They have aviation lights, uh, red and green, and even flashing lights uh, located on the mirror. It was very easy to, uh, to see the thing during the fly around. Next slide. Well, our uh, joint program with uh, the Russians didn't stop when we undocked. One of our uh, objectives is to do a program of Earth observations of particular sites of interest to scientists, both in Russia and right here at the Johnson Space Center. 
where a fantastic uh, group of people studies uh, the Earth from space and disseminates all that information to scientists all around the world on a continuous basis. We carried uh, plenty of film and plenty of uh, Hasselblad cameras to bring you back a few shots, and we're just going to show you a couple here, but we have uh, several thousand more that we'll be showing you over uh, the next couple of years as they trickle out of uh, Building 8. Next slide, please. This is uh, the view out the aft windows of an area that's been in the news uh, uh, quite a bit. This is the Middle East. The tail is pointing to the city of Jerusalem uh, in Israel, and the, the Jordan River connects the Dead Sea at the bottom or center of the picture uh, to the Sea of Galilee uh, up near the top. And uh, just a fabulous area of the world to fly around. Of course, it's a desert, so you can see it. There's not a lot of clouds. Uh, and we enjoyed very much flying over it uh, pretty much every day. Next slide. And this is an area that uh, I saw for the first time, but it's because it had not been cloudy. When they talk about deforestation in the rainforest, this is it. This is uh, an area the size of about um, half of uh, Pennsylvania in uh, the Brazilian state of Rondonia along Brazilian Road 364. And we've watched in pictures from the shuttle that are analyzed here at the Johnson Space Center, this area just getting less and less of the dark forest and more and more of the light green farmland. Unfortunately, the farmland is not usable for very long. Uh, after as little as three to four seasons, the soil becomes unusable. It's just not suitable for uh, farming. And uh, they abandon it and take the chainsaws a little further into the rainforest. Next slide, please. This is uh, an awesome example of the power of nature as well as the power of man to transform the planet. This is Typhoon Violet. It's northeast of the Philippines. And uh, you can almost feel the atmosphere getting sucked down into that giant low pressure area where the hole is at the eye of the storm there in the center, hundreds of miles away from it. Next one. And uh, we'll end our Earth observations with uh, a beautiful scene of the aurora uh, and the tail of the orbiter lit up by moonlight while the stars flicker in the background there. And you can see some of the stars that appear to be uh, closer to us than the planet there. That's uh, because there's a little air uh, that you can actually see through, and there's that yellow layer right at the top of the atmosphere that's up about 60 miles that uh, you can see through. So that's, that is our uh, fragile planet down here and protected by this very thin layer of, uh, of Earth. And we as a crew were very happy to be able to fly the spaceship that uh, you all built and operated for us uh, to get, uh, get up there and see these beautiful sights. This is just a portrait of our crew uh, taken in the base block of uh, the Mir station. And the $64,000 question is, who took the picture? <laughs> <laughs> well, that concludes the slides. We, uh, we have a short movie that we'd like to show you uh, of footage that we uh, assembled from, uh, from our mission. Our sponsor? <laughs> <laughs> the crew patch. This is uh, suiting up before we're getting ready to go. Terry Wilcutt, the pilot. Jay Apt, MS-1. MS-2, Tom Akers. MS-3, Carl Waltz. And John. <laughs> NASA Mir number three. On our way out to the Astrovan, still awfully, awfully dark at that hour of the morning, let me tell you. About to light up, though, big, uh, big time. Six seconds there prior to liftoff, the main engines come up for thrust. And we're on our way. First master alarm. <laughs> the doggone thing was shaking so much that Terry and I had uh, a real time trying to read the, uh, the scratch pad line and what was going on. Fortunately, we had Tom there to mid-value select between the pilot and the commander, and he <laughs> properly informed us what, what was going on with our vehicle. I think the folks that were there at the Cape had a real spectacular view, uh, not only of the SRB separation, uh, a little after two minutes, but uh, all the way up the East Coast. We're going to get a little bit closer view here. 
and a special uh, camera in the umbilical wells that uh, was able to capture that. Unfortunately, uh, the external tank came off uh, in darkness, so there wasn't any uh, residual light from the, from the main engines or anything to capture that. Well, once we got on orbit, we opened the payload bay doors to reject some of the heat, of course, uh, <coughs> produced by the fuel cells and got a first real good uh, look at the space tab in the back end of the payload bay and the orbiter docking system and the trajectory control sensors, those uh, boxes right on the beam in the front of the cargo bay. Very happy to see everything was in good shape. We opened up the hatch to get back into the space tab a couple hours after launch, uh, after verification that all of the atmosphere back there was good. And it's uh, the first flight of a new habitable volume. It went just great. What a wonderful place to work and uh, have all the logistics and live and sleep. It was just huge. Uh, I mean, it was like a uh, big building inside. And those of you who have offices around JSC know what I mean when I say uh, this is a lot bigger than any office I've ever had. <laughs> Terry's uh, getting ready here to transfer uh, some of the water, specifically squeezing out a sample into a sample bag for analysis on the ground. And boy, uh, it's a good thing he was in the best shape of anybody on the crew, except maybe Shannon to go do that. But uh, it was pretty hard. Here we are uh, checking out one of uh, the JSC experiments on board a uh, bioreactor, so-called. It uh, is designed to supply uh, nutrients to all size of a cell in three dimensions. Unlike a two-dimensional Petri dish, uh, cells can grow just like they do in the living body. We took sterile uh, samples of that, as John will do every uh, week that he's up on orbit to ensure for the principal investigator, a doctor up at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, that everything is working well. Uh, if all goes well, we'll learn how well cartilage, like is in your knees or your nose, uh, grows up there on orbit. Uh, here we are on the second day of the flight, preparing the active rack isolation system, a risk mitigation experiment at the space station for tests. We tilted the rack out just as people will do hundreds of times on the International Space Station. Uh, and this thing that's uh, about the size of a big vending machine here and uh, about the same weight too, we're real careful with. And uh, it took all three of us to get that out there and make sure uh, it was all in good shape. Then Carl and I went to work uh, setting it up for what turned out to be many days of tests on board. The idea of uh, that system was to isolate the small vibrations that you have in space uh, for the benefit of experiments such as this one. This is a furnace that was to melt metals. Splintered metals uh, are used in everything from machine tools to exotic space structures. Here we are inserting a sample into that furnace for melting and uh, later analysis on the ground. Back in the back, uh, Tom was examining all of his transfer items and getting uh, everything ready uh, for transfer. And here he's getting a computer out that uh, John will need on Mir and putting it into a bag where it can be efficiently transferred as soon as we get docked. Did a fabulous job getting everything ready so that when we docked, bang, it was ready. And everything got over. Uh, it was just super. The bright star that you see in the center of the uh, optical site there is the Mir station. And uh, at this point, we're about two miles away. And we're going to show you just a couple time slices here. Now we're about uh, a mile away. Now we're getting to about 600 feet. And this is how we had the cockpit laid out. Terry was uh, in the front, and he was doing the mid-course burn. Jay uh, had the master checklist. And then Tom was doing the handheld laser, and Carl was working the camera as well. John was our communicator. And that uh, left me free to do a little bit of flying. And what you can see here are the forward reaction control jets uh, firing as we're approaching the Mir station. This is uh, approximately 170 feet as we're continuing to close. And you can, uh, you can see the whole Mir station at that point. Uh, Shannon's eye view of us uh, on our approach. Here we're about 10 feet, and you can see the docking module very well coming into the, the payload bay. And this is a view out of our uh, truss camera that was located adjacent to our docking system. And you can see that the closure is just ever, ever so slow. It's uh, about a yard in, uh, in 30 seconds, so you almost can't walk that slowly. About this time, uh, Tom is calling pedal overlap. And then when we get to two inches, we fire uh, close contact thrusters to just nudge the two vehicles together so that we get uh, uh, a hard docking.
there was great rejoicing. <laughs> <laughs> On the other side of the hatch, too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this, is, uh, this is Shannon in the docking module, uh, waiting expectantly for uh, our hatch to open here. And uh, Bill is doing that right now. And of course, uh, uh, the Mir 22 crew, uh, Valeri and Sasha and Shannon are, are there on the other side waiting for us. <coughs> so Bill goes to shake Valeri's hand and uh, get uh, brought into the docking module here. And so, and this is a view from, from their camera on board Mir. And uh, of course, it was, it was a great, just a tremendous celebration uh, meeting together in space. Uh, and of course, here's John and Shannon. Uh, yeah, glad, glad to be together uh, again after about a six-month uh, separation uh, since they were training together in Star City. And uh, Shannon had the traditional greeting of bread and salt. Uh, it's a traditional Russian greeting, and, and uh, we celebrated uh, together. Well, with Mir hard docked uh, to the shuttle and the welcoming ceremonies uh, complete, it was uh, time to go to work, and we got uh, quite a bit of the transfer operations done that first day. This is Terry and I back in the space hab. You can see one of the large Russian pieces of hardware we were bringing home already there, a KERS unit. We had uh, two of those. We also did, for the first time, uh, powered transfers, where we had uh, scientific experiments under power on the shuttle that we powered down and then moved over to Mir. This is Jay. It's one of two uh, incubators that uh, keep a controlled temperature environment uh, for a different, uh, several different varieties of samples in those. Took it over to the uh, new module on Mir, Perota, and inserted it in a locker and, uh, and powered it up. During all of the uh, transfer operations and other activities, Shannon, every day we were there, exercised uh, for two hours each day here on the treadmill in uh, the base block. And one of the final transfer items, which Carl uh, mentioned, was the 350 pounds of Russian food we had in the Eris experiment. And this is uh, just checking to make sure we hadn't left any in before we stowed the empty containers. Now we'll take a quick look, a quick tour of uh, Mir, which was my home for six months. Now, as you see, we're going through here, we were going through the docking module, and now this is in uh, Crystal. Um, you can see that there's lots of ventilation tubes, there's lots of wires, there's uh, lots of equipment that's stored there. And there's a bungee cord that sort of helps you uh, navigate back and forth. Uh, actually, oh, well, first we're going to stop off here at the um, greenhouse. Uh, due to the slip, I was fortunate and was able to uh, get this started. And it was really sort of neat to see the wheat, see it uh, uh, start to grow. It reminded me of Oklahoma, you know, where I used to live. <laughs> and uh, for the first time, just before I left, the wheat was actually going to seed. And so for the first time in space, we had started with the seed and it had gone to seed. And so I think that's just uh, pretty neat. Going on, this is Perota, the new uh, module that came while I was there. And it's full of uh, various scientific equipment. As you can see, there's a glove box and it just works outstanding. Actually, everything that, all the United States equipment that was there in Perota worked really, really well. This chair there in the middle is one of the French experiments that came up on progress and it's left there. There's just lots of equipment uh, in Mir. There's German equipment, uh, French equipment, there's uh, the United States equipment, and it's all there. And it's very difficult to find places to store, uh, store stuff. Go in the back of Perota, you can see the uh, BTS and the uh, rest of the United States experiments. Now, this is uh, the node, and everything joins up here. And when, after Perota came and then after Pro Progress came, uh, Yuri pointed out to me that for the first time in the history of the Station of Mir, all the nodes were occupied, and that was a new record. Uh, that's what it was designed for, and that's how it uh, got set up. Oh, and this is inside Soyuz, uh, which is there, and there's our uh, responders. In case there was an emergency, we could have gotten in the Soyuz and uh, uh, come home. And the Soyuz is still there, and uh, it's the return vehicle for Valeri and uh, Sasha. This is in the base block, and you can see the uh, uh, table back there. Valeri's back there by the table. The table was sort of the central place in Mir, and that's where, uh, if you weren't 
working somewhere else, just sort of congregated there to talk, uh, talk to the ground, eat, and do all the various activities that uh, uh, you have. And then uh, you could look, the cosmonauts each had a small uh, cabin on each side, which was very nice. They could keep their personal things there. And then they had a little window that they could look out. And this happens to be uh, Sasha's uh, uh, little cabin and the pictures of uh, his family. He has a uh, three-month-old son, and so he had his pictures uh, hanging up there. And then all their personal equipment, their um, toothpaste and everything could be kept in one place. And then the sleeping bag was hung up on the wall. And as you looked out the uh, window when the shuttle was there, then you could see the shuttle dock there. Uh, also in the base block was a ham radio, and uh, we used it uh, to talk. And many times when you were coming over Houston, uh, you could talk to your family, and Larry and Sasha also liked to use the ham radio a lot. This is another view in the base block going toward the Central Post, and Valeri was uh, headed in that direction. And you can see the bungee cords that were stretched out there to help you uh, navigate back and forth. This is Inspector. John has just moved in. It was all nice and clean and all picked up, but then all the <laughs> new stuff got in there. And you can see, uh, I like to read. I had lots of books. I put them in bookcase up there uh, about halfway through the flight. When Yuri came in, he looked and he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I like to have my books out. I like to look at it. It makes me feel good. And he said, well, what's John going to think about that? <laughs> and I said, well, he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the uh, back end of Spectre. And you can see uh, those are the big great things are two cameras. Uh, Earth viewing cameras. But then those white bags are all the uh, science equipment that we transferred over for John. They're all stacked up there. And then that's where I had all the bags of science equipment stacked up uh, to take over to um, uh, the shuttle. Just another one of the large storms we saw where we were up there, Typhoon Yates. Now, fortunately, none of them were around KS3 on the 26th. <laughs> they were they were just simply spectacular. If you could see those at night, uh, you saw all kinds of lightning. We had the Mir crew over to the shuttle for a, a dinner that we hosted. Uh, we treated them to some freeze-dried local Cajun barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> they enjoyed that very much. And it was time to go, and unfortunately. But we uh, had our formal farewell ceremony and said goodbye to really two <coughs> very close friends of ours, uh, Valeria and Sasha. And then we said goodbye to uh, the new Mir crew member, and. Uh, it was a very emotional flight, I'd have to say. It was emotional picking Shannon up, and it was emotional saying goodbye to John. Uh, if you look at the hatch that they're closing, you can see the docking target on it. And if you look carefully at a still picture, you can see the repair we made to it uh, while we were up there. This is the undocking early in the morning. There's springs in the docking mechanism that push the two uh, space vehicles apart. And then once you get two feet away, we activate the jets, and uh, then Bill gave some uh, pulses to separate us at a, a more rapid rate. This is a view out uh, one of the, uh, the truss camera, we call it. It's, it's an alternating, uh, alter, alternate docking camera. Again, there goes the docking module away from us. We drifted out to uh, about 150 feet, and then Bill and I traded places so that I could do the uh, fly around. And my hat's off to all the ground people that arranged the timing. So we got pictures like this. This is the southern island of New Zealand. The southern Alps are on there. Uh, our geologists are particularly interested in this area because it has a, a lot of volcanoes and some geologic faults. Again, the mirror in, a, in another attitude uh, during the fly around. It seemed to change colors depending on how close we were to the Terminator. It was really, really beautiful. This is off the coast of Australia. Uh, and that's a, that island that the mirror is approaching right now is Fraser Island, and the town of Bisbane is just up the coast from that. Here's the northeastern part of Australia again. It's um, one of the capes up there, and what you've got on the left side, as we look at it, is the Great Barrier Reef, and on the right side of Australia there is the Gulf of Carpentaria. Again, we did the fly around to set up shots for, uh, for the IMAX and, again, for uh, mirror photo survey. Then it was really was time to go home. We finished up the science and the packing in the back and closed the doors. I couldn't figure out why Shannon wanted to watch this, but uh, 
Then we turned our uh, space shuttle into the re-entry vehicle that it was designed to be. The pink out the window is the fire or the plasma that surrounds the orbiter during re-entry. That stuff seems to reach a critical mass up around the tail and you get the explosions like that that give the orbiter a, a thump every time you see an explosion. That's sunrise over my right shoulder uh, while we're in a row there. Bill? Well, we had uh, almost a 360 degree turn to get aligned with uh, runway 15 at the Cape and it was a right hand turn all the way around. So I looked at nothing but instruments and Terry had a real nice view of the Cape. Uh, got rolled out on final and uh, it was just the most perfect day you can imagine to come back to Florida. Just a light breeze, about 80 degrees and uh, bright sunshine. Terry put the gear down there at 300 feet. Doing the final flare here at about 50 feet. We never did see the birds, by the way. <laughs> and coming on in. And I'll tell you, the orbiter just handles like a dream. You could see uh, a little bit of oscillation as the drag chute comes out. Nose uh, is cushioned onto the runway by the drag chute disc reefing. And then... Uh, Dog on drag chute works so good that uh, you just don't even need any brakes hardly at all. And uh, about 90 knots, we just kind of tested them just to make sure they were working. And we stopped with about uh, 3,000 feet to go there at the uh, Kennedy Space Center. We had a surprise mystery guest welcome us home. Tell you, uh, we were uh, just terrifically honored and, and proud to be there, to be with uh, Shannon and welcome her home, to be the first to welcome her home, I guess, from, uh, from space, President Clinton and uh, Mr. Golden. We got a chance to give them one of, uh, one of our crew symbols and uh, crew hat and, of course, a welcome home Shannon t-shirt. So. 